Welcome to section two of metabolism. In this section, we'll be discussing glycolysis. Let's get started. So what is glycolysis? It's a key metabolic pathway that occurs in all cells in which glucose is converted into pyruvate. It's important to know that this pathway occurs within the cytoplasm of cells, and the end result is the production of cellular energy. This is achieved through the production of two important molecules, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, and nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD. When NAD is bound to a hydrogen molecule, it's called NADH. This figure is from section one of metabolism and provides an overview of the key metabolic pathways. In this section, we're focusing on glycolysis, which you can see right here. If we zoom up on glycolysis, we get this figure, which is from section two of metabolism in your book. Notice that the key enzymes are shown in red. Also note that some of the reactions are reversible, as you can see by the bi-directional arrows, while others are irreversible, shown by the red arrows. This dotted line right here is important to keep in mind because the reactions below the line occur two times for every one molecule of glucose. Notice that the six carbon molecule fructose 1,6-bisphosphate right here, so six carbons, is broken into two separate three carbon molecules, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP. So both of these are three carbon molecules. The DHAP gets converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, so we end up with two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate that go through the rest of the pathway. Okay, with this in mind, let's review the first steps of the pathway. In the last video, we discussed hexokinase and glucokinase, which you can see right here. These enzymes catalyze the first reaction of glycolysis, which converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. Notice from the image that this reaction has a star next to it as well. We talk about this more in the endocrinology chapter, but you should know that decreased function of glucokinase is associated with maturity onset diabetes of the young, which you can see right here. Now let's discuss the rate limiting step of glycolysis, which is shown right here. It's important to know that this point regulates whether or not the cell is performing glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. If we go down the pathway towards the bottom of the screen, the cell is performing glycolysis. With the reverse pathway, the cell is performing gluconeogenesis. We'll discuss gluconeogenesis in a future video, but it's important to know that gluconeogenesis primarily occurs within the liver. So when we discuss how this step is tightly regulated, we're primarily referring to glycolysis versus gluconeogenesis as it appears in the liver. Okay, let's focus on this part of the pathway. Notice that fructose 6-phosphate can be converted into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is shown on both sides. The left side of the image shows how fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is regulated during glycolysis, and the right side of the image shows how it's regulated during gluconeogenesis. Let's focus on the left side first. Notice that fructose 6-phosphate is converted to fructose 2,6-bisphosphate by the enzyme phosphofructokinase 2, right here. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate induces glycolysis by upregulating the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1. This is the enzyme that converts fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Also notice that citrate and ATP, shown right here, inhibit this conversion. This makes sense. When the cell has a lot of energy, metabolites from the TCA cycle will increase. Citrate and ATP are metabolites from the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain and act as a way of telling the cell to stop glycolysis because the cell already has enough energy. From the figure, we can also see that in the well-fed state, insulin levels will be high, which will increase hepatic concentrations of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which will result in increased glycolysis. This makes sense. The liver senses that the tissues have enough glucose, so it will utilize glucose for its own needs by performing glycolysis, and then it will store the remaining glucose into glycogen. Let's draw this out. This will represent the liver, and this will represent skeletal muscle tissue. When blood glucose levels are high, both the skeletal muscle and the liver are utilizing the glucose. In this scenario, insulin will be high, which will increase the concentration of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. When fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is high, this will result in increased hepatic glycolysis. Again, the liver senses that the tissues have enough glucose, 
So it will utilize glucose for its own needs by performing glycolysis, and then it will store the remaining glucose into glycogen. On the other hand, in the fasting state, glucagon levels will be high, which will decrease hepatic concentrations of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which will result in decreased glycolysis. This makes sense too. The liver senses that the tissues do not have enough glucose, so it will halt hepatic glycolysis and instead increase gluconeogenesis to provide the body with the glucose that it needs. Notice that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate normally inhibits fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. This enzyme normally converts fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, which ultimately allows the liver to produce glucose. Therefore, if fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is decreased, then the activity of this enzyme will be increased, resulting in increased gluconeogenesis. Let's draw this out. Again, this will represent the liver, and this will represent skeletal muscle tissue. When blood glucose levels are low, the skeletal muscle is starved for glucose, and the liver senses this. In this scenario, insulin will be low, and glucagon levels will be high. This will decrease the hepatic concentration of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which will halt hepatic glycolysis and increase hepatic gluconeogenesis. So increased gluconeogenesis. This allows the liver to break down amino acids, glycerol, and other products in order to create glucose. So we'll show the liver producing glucose here. The glucose can then enter the blood and travel to skeletal muscle tissue, which is in need of energy. So you can see that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate acts as an on-off switch for glycolysis. Okay, with this in mind, let's do a question. A new drug is being studied by a pharmaceutical company. During a series of experiments, the researchers noticed that this drug decreases the hepatic concentration of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. How will this drug likely alter the activity of aspartate transaminase? And notice that this enzyme normally converts aspartate to oxaloacetate. Okay, so essentially this question is asking how amino acid metabolism will be altered during gluconeogenesis. Recall that decreased fructose 2,6-bisphosphate results in increased gluconeogenesis. If gluconeogenesis is increased, then the catabolism of amino acids, glycerol, and other molecules will increase. Aspartate transaminase is an enzyme that breaks down the amino acid aspartate into oxaloacetate, which can then be utilized to make glucose. So again, this drug decreases the hepatic concentration of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which results in increased gluconeogenesis, which results in increased activity of aspartate transaminase. From our metabolic pathway, we can see that decreased fructose 2,6-bisphosphate releases the inhibition on this enzyme, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Therefore, the activity of fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is increased, resulting in increased production of glucose, or in other words, increased gluconeogenesis. Okay, let's move on to discuss a few other important aspects of glycolysis. As glycolysis continues, the metabolite 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is formed. It's important to know that in red blood cells, this metabolite can be converted into 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or 2,3-BPG. Notice that when red blood cells utilize this pathway, the generation of ATP is sacrificed. So notice that this step normally produces ATP, but we're bypassing this step. However, it's worth it for the red blood cells to do this if the tissues are hypoxic because 2,3-BPG increases oxygen unloading in peripheral tissues. You should recall from pulmonary physiology that 2,3-BPG is an important regulator of oxygen delivery to the tissues. It does this by binding to hemoglobin and decreasing its affinity for oxygen. So increased 2,3-BPG results in decreased hemoglobin affinity for oxygen, which results in increased oxygen release into the peripheral tissues. One of the last steps in the pathway is right here. In this step, phospholinylpyruvate is converted into pyruvate by the enzyme pyruvate kinase. This disorder is most pronounced in red blood cells and results in hemolysis. Decreased ATP in red blood cells would result in a decreased ability of the cell to pump cations against a concentration gradient, so the cell would not be able to maintain homeostasis, which would result in hemolysis. So if 
pyruvate kinase activity is decreased. This results in decreased ATP, which results in hemolysis. Notice that next to pyruvate kinase, there's a star, and this correlates with the disorder down here, pyruvate kinase deficiency. After pyruvate is formed, it can be converted into lactate or acetyl-CoA, depending on the conditions of the cell. If the cell doesn't have enough oxygen, then lactate is formed. If there is enough oxygen, or it's under aerobic conditions, then acetyl-CoA is formed, which can then be used in the TCA cycle. Under aerobic conditions, glucose metabolism normally generates 30 to 32 ATP. This varies because the NADH produced during glycolysis, you can see NADH right here, is ultimately used by the electron transport chain to produce ATP, and the way in which NADH enters the mitochondria can vary. Some cells use something called the malate shuttle, and others use something called the glycerol 3-phosphate shuttle in order to get NADH into the mitochondria. On the other hand, under anaerobic conditions, glucose metabolism only generates 2 net ATP. We'll discuss pyruvate metabolism in more detail in a separate video. Okay, let's do another question. A 9-year-old boy presents to the physician for a routine visit. He has a history of anemia due to an enzyme deficiency. Physical exam reveals splenomegaly and conjunctival pallor. CBC shows an elevated reticulocyte count and confirms a hemolytic anemia. What mechanism explains this patient's anemia? Hopefully from the question stem you notice that this boy has a pyruvate kinase deficiency. We can deduce this because the question stem states that he has an enzyme deficiency, an elevated reticulocyte count, and a hemolytic anemia. From the figure we can see that pyruvate kinase normally converts phosphoenolpyruvate to pyruvate and generates ATP in the process. If pyruvate kinase is deficient, then ATP is not able to be produced as much in red blood cells, and this results in a decreased ability of the cell to pump cations against a concentration gradient, so the cell is not able to maintain homeostasis, which results in hemolysis. So decreased pyruvate kinase results in decreased ATP, which results in hemolysis.